Okay. Good evening. My name is Donna Schneider and I'm the president of the Prince George's County Historical Society and welcome to tonight's history chat. We um, are recording the chats, um, so please mute your microphones. We will um, take questions at the end, so please put your questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the chat. Um, during, uh, during tonight's chat, author Jenny Massore will um, explain her research for her book, Maryland Freedom Seekers on the Underground Railroad, as being like a puzzle, like putting puzzle pieces together. But doing so requires many decisions. As she looks at what is available in terms of Marylanders' escapes to freedom, how does she choose which ones to focus on? How does she find information on this, these people? Decide what details to in include. Figure out how best to tell their stories. What's an example of an unproductive path to a story? And how did, you, how did she decide that? Is there a typical pathway to freedom? Host Lee Ryan will pose these questions and others to Jenny about her recent book. Just And now just a little bit about Jenny. Um, Jenny is a native Washingtonian. She worked for 17 years for the National Park Service as National Capital Regional Manager for the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. Her doctorate is in anthropology and her interest in individual lives dates from the oral history she co-edited while in graduate school. Her respect for the heroes of the Underground Railroad continues to grow. Lee, it's all you. Uh, it's all yours now. <laughs> all right, thanks, Donna. Um, Jenny's book, and here's here's a copy of it. Maryland Freedom Seekers on the Underground Railroad tells the stories of nine enslaved Marylanders who were determined to free themselves from slavery and escape. Um, I want to start. To ask a little bit about the title, I wonder if, Jenny, you could begin by explaining um, what the definition of the Underground Railroad is and, and tell us a bit about maybe where the term comes from. Well, my definition of the Underground Railroad is a little bit different than other people's. I've, I've switched the focus. I've shifted it to the people who are escaping. So the definition is one that we used in the National Park Service. It's resistance to slavery through flight. So that puts the emphasis on the fact that there would be no Underground Railroad without the people who are escaping. And the people who are escaping, we call freedom seekers because they were not fugitives. They did not believe they had broken the law. They did not believe they were property. We don't talk about them as being slaves because that sounds like it's a permanent condition. We talk about enslaved as it's something that can be changed. And usually I don't talk about runaways because that sounds a little bit like uh, people's pets that run away and these people did not consider themselves to be uh, belong to anyone. They belong to themselves. All right. Well, all right. Another part of your title focuses on our state, on Maryland. And you're writing about Maryland freedom seekers. So my question is, why, why Maryland? Um, what sets it apart for people who are freedom seekers from Maryland? from those who maybe are from, say, North or South Carolina? Well, Maryland it, it is interesting. I realized when I started to get into this, for one thing, you've got the geography, the border with Pennsylvania and with Delaware, which makes it easier to get into a free state. You've got the Chesapeake Bay, which is an enormous waterway and has rivers and creeks leading into the bay. So there are a lot of waterways on which people could escape. They did not have to use land. And you have the fact that slavery was official starting in 1664 in Maryland, which meant that by the time it finished in 1864, that's 200 years. 
And I think that's important because that means that the history of African Americans in the Chesapeake is much longer than it is in many other parts of the United States. Okay. Now, you, when you were talking to me about doing research for this, this book, you explained it as, as being like a puzzle, like taking all these pieces and putting them together. And doing so means lots of making lots of decisions as you go along. Um, so I'm I'm wondering as you looked at what's available in terms of of Marylanders escapes to freedom, how did you choose the ones to focus on? Well, I thought I knew nine people off the bat, but it turned out that I didn't. When I started to look at people, there either wasn't enough information. They were very well known, like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. And I thought, if they have books written about them already, let's go to the people who are lesser known heroes of the Underground Railroad, so to speak, and look at them. I suspect that there are people in every county in Maryland. I didn't find people in every county, but I think with some more digging, there would be people who either passed through, started out, or possibly ended up at the border with uh, Pennsylvania. And I also was looking for some women and some uh, younger people and people who came from scattered counties across the state, not just from uh, Montgomery and Prince George's or from Baltimore. Okay. Um, so you decided not to include people like Harriet Tubman or, or Frederick Douglass, but you're including others that, that you came across. You said that there you thought you knew nine, but you didn't. Why didn't you know nine? <laughs> well, some of them were did not have enough information or okay. they're about to, they're about to be written about. There's one book, for example, by about someone named O.C. Gilbert, and one of the descendants is writing the book right now. There's someone named Charity Still, who is the mother of uh, William Still, and mm -hmm. they're commemorating her on the Eastern Shore. At this, uh, They're setting up a Charity Still Center, so I thought there's I shouldn't take away the uh, focus that that they were placing on the Eastern shore. And I'm trying to think some of the other people, I just didn't have enough information or they all came from the same county. Can I ask you one thing here too? Not everybody may know who William Still is. Can you fill us in on that? Oh, okay. William Still was a man who um, was freeborn and ended up in Philadelphia working for one of the um, abolitionist societies, which helped people as they came through Philadelphia seeking freedom. And it, he kept notes on everyone he interviewed before they got help. And he published the notes after the Civil War. So those his book is very important. It's... Yeah. Uh, been his material turns out uh, has been confirmed by historians, so they know that uh, what he had to say was um, very well documented. And he, in fact, one of the people who came through was his brother, his long lost brother. So it's a very interesting story. Okay. So anyway, you did focus on nine different people, and you've got Alexander Helmsley, um, Moses Viney, is that how you pronounce his name? Yes. Okay. And Basil Dorsey, John Thompson, James Watkins, Matilda and Richard Neal. Uh, one thing that, that strikes me here is that there seem to be mostly men. And we have one married couple. Is there... Uh, 
Can you explain why that would be the case? Well, it's partly due to the sources. Three of the chapters are based on so-called slave narratives, and there are very, very few slave narratives written by women for whatever reasons. Uh, either they did not uh, want to publicize their past when they got to the North, or the abolitionists were not as interested in them because women were not favored as much in the 19th century as men were. I don't know if that's enough of an answer. Well, do you want to slave narratives? Are you talking about the the uh, works uh, progress? I'm talking what slave narratives are the memoirs written or written with help uh, from the mouths of people who escaped. So, so they're like celebrity books as told to. Usually. Okay, so it's the WPA narratives and others then? Uh, no, it's before the WPA narratives. It's okay. like Frederick Douglass's book. Uh, yes. And several of them are called The Life of, of So-and-So, and So-and-So is the person who escaped. Uh, Josiah Henson wrote three, and Frederick Douglass wrote three, and, and uh, various other people from Maryland. And then I also, okay. uh, that, since those were mostly men, and then I looked at people who appeared in the newspaper, and those were usually men. And then I looked at people who were described in contemporary sources, and those were usually men. There was another woman that I was going to include, but I didn't have time to put her in. And she was a very interesting example, but there wasn't time or space. Uh, the book was limited in terms of words. Okay, you said appeared in newspapers. Can you explain, do you mean in ads or? Well, some there are more women in ads, but you have an okay. ad and then you want to know a little bit more about the person than that. And when you start looking, you're looking for uh, letters by the uh, person who claimed ownership of, of the freedom seeker. You're okay. looking for newspaper articles describing an incident during the escape of the freedom seeker. And it was not as easy for women to escape because they had the responsibility for their children and their parents. And they probably didn't want to leave anybody behind and the uh, a lot of the other people who escaped were younger men or people whose families had been sold away from them and they didn't have the same ties okay so these but these were articles then about these people written yes yes you can find articles written often in the abolitionist press but not exclusively okay. the baltimore sun was by no means an abolitionist newspaper and there are a lot of articles about freedom seekers ah okay so where did you find information i mean you've already mentioned something about some newspapers um where how did you find information on the people that you wrote about where did you go how did you do research for the book well, there was a lot of networking involved. I was working with a lot of local historians. A couple of the chapters, most of the research was done by someone else who very kindly gave me permission to use their research. For example, there's one chapter that was done by the a white descendant of um, someone who freed all of the people he enslaved, and the uh, family continued to be involved with the people who were free. And two of those people were uh, running to Philadelphia. Whose story is that? That's the Neals. That's Richard and Matilda Neal. Ah, okay. And so that's a very interesting story. And I told it from a different point of view than the person who uh, did the research. Well, he was lucky enough to have a family album of newspaper articles and uh, historic documents. So he had a very special source. 
And that's the kind of thing you want to find, but you don't often find. Uh, I'm just trying to think of who else is another example. Uh, Moses Viney, for example, the information on him, he fled and was given shelter by a college in uh, Schenectady, Union College. Right. And while he, they did not uh, have a, a slave narrative for him, they apparently the students and the other people interviewed him. And the, there were articles printed in the student newspaper and the student magazine. Uh, although, of course, they're from the point of view of the person who's writing it, not of Moses Viney himself. So that's another interesting example of a source that is unusual, but the people at the college knew about it. And um, it was uh, in a, one of the nominations to the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. So, Can you explain those nominations? Well, the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom is a National Park Service program that was uh, chartered by Congress. And the idea is to network across the United States to get people who are working on the history of the Underground Railroad to document their history and then submit it in um, a documentable form uh, to the uh, program so it goes into the public domain and it could be publicized and that way it does not disappear when the, the historian dies or when they uh, lose interest or whatever. So does that mean that there's information there that's available to people who who would like it? Yes, there is. And there's also a very good uh, website that the Maryland State Archives has, the Legacy of Slavery in Maryland, and that has a database of runaway ads. It has a database of uh, newspaper articles and uh, a lot of profiles of people who are known to have escaped so it really is a very rich source of history uh, of the Underground Railroad in Maryland. All right, so let's take an example. So you get a, a, a lead of some sort on a person that you want to follow up with more information on. How would you go about doing that? I mean, it's lovely to have all these sources, but how do you know where to go or what well, you can access where? I would start, one place I would start is the County Historical Society. And there are digitized databases of newspapers. And I was lucky enough to have uh, access to newspapers.com. And then there's a database that the Library of Congress has. And there are a couple of other databases and you can search for people's names. But of course, in the case of people escaping, they have two names often. They have the name that they were called when they were enslaved and they have the name that they took when they were freed. And sometimes it's hard to match those people up. So what else would you do? I mean, I'm also wondering, could you find them by owner's names or things like that? Well, you can use the slave census of 1850 or 1860. You can approach a uh, plantation that survived either in, still in private hands or in public hands is easier and ask them if they have any papers of the owners that talk about people who escaped and sometimes you hit the jackpot, you can go, most of these people did not stay in Maryland. They, in fact, none of them did. They all ended up in other places. And in, there's sometimes at the other end, there's more information than there is in Maryland. And so you have to go to the other end and look for it there. So the person who was in Schenectady, there's more, much more information there that the library and the college in the town have than there are in 
uh, in Maryland about him. Incidentally, it just occurred to me that if any of you have questions as we're going along, if you want to put them in the chat, then towards the end, we'll start answering whatever we can. Um, okay, but I wanna go back, Jenny, to um, some of what you were just talking about. How, like, what would you look for? I mean, obviously, if you if you see that there's a connection to a school, he, as a place of employment or something, that, that would be a good place to see, is there anything at all there? But if you were, if you find that someone ends up in a particular geographic area, you're mentioning going to an historical society library or whatever, what would you start looking for there? Well, I would ask them if they have any stories of, of uh, freedom seekers. I'd ask them if they have any newspaper files that can be searched uh, to look for people's obituaries or stories uh, featuring someone who had been a freedom seeker. And usually it's when they're older after the Civil War that there may be a story about them. Moses Viney lived to be in his 90s. And so he was a popular topic for uh, newspaper articles in Schenectady. Uh -huh. Okay, so then if you unearth all these details or some details about people, um, how do you figure out what to include or how best to tell their stories? Well, for one thing, I was limited in terms of number of words for the whole manuscript. So that was one constraint. The other thing is I didn't want each chapter to read exactly the same. So-and-so was born in, was enslaved by, fled on such and such a date, and ended up uh, happily ever after, not so happily ever after in certain place. I wanted the chapters to be a little bit different and I tried to pick people whose stories were different. So there's one person who escaped ultimately by joining the crew of a whaling ship. He was on the whaler for two years. And by the time he came back, the people were not chasing after him. There was somebody else who went to England and became an anti-slavery lecturer. And so there are articles in English papers or British papers, I, uh, I should call them. And uh, in fact, I found out that there was a, a scholar in England who is uh, focusing on him. And I think she's she's done a chapter in a book and she may be doing a book on um, uh, the, that, that chapter that I did. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Uh, let's see, what who was it? That's James Watkins, who went to England. Uh, and you want to know what else? Yes. <laughs> what else? You want to know what else? Okay. Um, how else did I pick people? Well, I'd say, oh, I don't have anybody from the Eastern Shore. How am I going to find somebody from the Eastern Shore? And so there was a nomination for the Network to Freedom for Moses Viney. So I found one that way. I wanted somebody from Frederick County. And it so happened that there was somebody in the Park Service who had done a lot of research in Frederick County on the Underground Railroad. And he had come across someone named Basil Dorsey. Uh, and it turned out that there was some Basil Dorsey, which was the name the person took once he was freed, uh, lived in Massachusetts. And there was someone in Florence, Massachusetts, who was fascinated by this man, Basil Dorsey, and wanted to know where, more about where he came from. All he knew was that he came from Frederick County. And the two historians connected, and the story was put together. So that was one that I did some additional research on, but I got the information thanks to the other two historians. That's where an example of historians working together across geographical uh, 
boundaries, so to speak. So did you find any stories that surprised you? I mean, were there things that you you uncovered that you did not expect to find? Well, uh, the story of the Neils is a story of revenge. And you, some of the people that I write about, we don't know what happened to them after they were freed. But in the case of the Neils, we know that they, uh, the wife ran with the children, was caught, and the husband, who was freed already, got help from um, a mentor back in Maryland and was able to raise the money to buy the, the, his wife and children um, after they had been sold to a slave dealer. And that then they went to live in Philadelphia and they appear in the Philadelphia census and they seem to be living happily ever after. But the owner was not willing to forgive uh, the woman. And he, he waited two years and then sent people after her. Uh, at, not after her, because she was legally mm -hmm. free after the husband who was free. But they said that he was enticing people to escape. And they were going to take him back to Maryland to be uh, tried there. So that was a rather surprising story. Were they successful? In taking him back to Maryland? No. Yeah. A complicated story <laughs> with a lot of twists and turns, but ultimately they were not successful. Wow. Well, I mean, I'm sure that there were repercussions. I know um, in some of the research that I've done on the Plummer family, Emily Saunders Plummer's younger brother, Robert Arnold, escaped. And he wrote back to his family members. He was literate. Well, he wrote back to his family members in Lanham, actually, and um, said he, he was mentioned that he uh, was thinking of coming back to get some of them. Um, which led the owners in Lanham to say, no, 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 and to start selling people away and splitting up the family uh, when they got when they got that information from Robert. So it was a big mistake for him to have to have done that and it and meant repercussions for the rest of the family still here. Did you find, I mean, anything similar or well. When people escaped, they never knew what was going to happen to their families. The families might be held responsible for the escape okay. and might be punished. And there was a case of one person who went back before the Civil War to get some of his family members. And his mother told him that she was free, but she didn't have access to the freedom papers. And so he couldn't take anybody back up north with him. But that was an example of his worrying about what had happened to his family after he left. So that's one example. Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, did you did you go to St. Catharines to go across into Canada to see if you could dig up any more information? Well, remember, this was a pandemic when I was writing this. Oh, of course. <laughs> I, I was very lucky. Uh, I don't know whether it's because people had less to do during the pandemic because people weren't coming into their the places where they were working, into the archives and historical societies. But I wrote to St. Catharines, and people there were very generous with information. Uh, so one person ended up in St. Catharines. Uh, some of the other places I just guessed, you know, if, if they were in Schenectady, maybe, uh, you know, the college or some other place might have the information. Uh, one case, the woman escaped to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and it turns out the Dickinson College, which is in Carlisle, has information about them. Uh, one of the professors has collected information, so that's a source of information. He had a, has a um, website of articles about some of the history, 19th century history of the town. 
So there are sources like that. Once you start saying, well, maybe somebody from the college, so I might write a professor. And sometimes I was lucky and sometimes I didn't get an answer. Uh, and like I said, I, I was looking in digital databases. Ah, okay. Yeah, I like you, I have found um, sometimes colleges and their records to be a great resource of people who attended there and the years they were there, what they studied even. I, I found that certainly with the Plummer family. Um, why, I mean, this is your second book where you're looking at local people who were freedom seekers. And I'm, I'm, the message I get from that is that you really think it's important that we know about these people and we know their stories. Uh, what do you consider their legacy? Well, I think there are two ways to look at that. There, there, there's the legacy of the time period in which they escaped when they were present, represented hope to the people who were still enslaved and became, were an irritant in the um, skin, so to speak, of the slave owners. And that was very important for the uh, history of abolition. It was a blow against people, saw, the abolitionists and the enslaved people saw it as a blow, blow against what they called the slaveocracy. Mm -hmm. And the abolitionists used the stories of the enslaved people, say enslaved narratives or newspaper articles to get more support for uh, freeing people from slavery. And the you could see what happened as as the abolition movement moved across the north. Okay. Well, but, I mean, I, I I didn't answer the second half, which is today. What what do I see as a legacy? Mm -hmm. um, at both times, I see them as a source of inspiration, but they show the accomplishments of the formerly enslaved often. I've heard people say so-and-so was the child or the grandchild of someone who was enslaved and they were able to accomplish X. And I want to show that the people who were enslaved themselves when given an opportunity were able to accomplish many things. Uh, Frederick Douglass was not unique. He was an outstanding example, but he was not unique. Um, and then I want to show that a few people can make a difference. So is that is that the basis for the statement on the back of the book where you say Maryland was the starting point of many unsung heroes? Well, I considered Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman to be people that kids in school hear about every year in Black mm -hmm. and but they don't hear about all these other people. They don't realize that there were many people who undertook the hard, perilous ver uh, journey to freedom. And I think they need to know that all around them, their people were starting from slavery. And often people don't realize where slavery existed. They think it was mainly in the deep South. A lot of people don't see Maryland as the middle ground, as a state that was halfway between freedom and slavery. Okay, you mean geographically or? Geographically and also in terms of the population because there were free many free blacks and because there were abolitionists who could move fairly openly. And uh, say in Alabama or Louisiana, that was not the, the case to the same extent. Okay. okay. Um, can you say anything in general about these people who sought freedom on the Underground Railroad? Um, anything in general about what it takes? I mean, this is just an enormous risk. Um, what qualities these freedom seekers might have had in common, how you see some of those those qualities exemplified, um, some of the things they may have encountered? Well, 
I think it really gets down to people who took the irrevocable decision to escape. Once they made that decision, then they were committed. They couldn't go back. And they were lucky, so to speak. The people we know about were able to achieve freedom. There may have been other people who achieved freedom we don't know about. And there may have been many people who escaped who were taken back and punished or sold south or even uh, killed, murdered. So we're looking at a, a special group when we look at the people that we know about today. And I'd say those people had a lot of gumption. They had prepared and planned before they escaped. They had a tremendous desire for freedom and they were persistent and determined. Okay. I mean, I, I just, I think of the enormous risk, particularly of those who did so with children, young children. We were talking about that earlier, you and I were, and uh, the difficulties of traveling with as the plumbers planned, a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and you can't just tell children that age to be quiet. Um, well, there are some people who felt so strongly that they did not want their children to grow up in slavery, that they were willing to risk that, risk something happening to the, themselves or their children. Um, Every, you know, the story is well known of Margaret Garner, who ended up murdering a couple of her children because right. she didn't want them to be taken back to Kentucky to slavery. Yes, and it also reminds me of, of, of Harriet Jacobs' comments when she escapes after seven years living in her grandmother's attic. Um and ends up as a governess in New York and, and travels with the family to England, but she sees peasants there living in, in a terrible squalor and yet looks at them and says, I would take this over being a slave, even if I could have better food, better lodging, better whatever, that it's so horrible to be enslaved that it's worth the risk. Well, so that brings up an interesting point, which I think that when you think about people who are escaping on the Underground Railroad, you have to consider whether slavery is exactly the mirror image uh, in the reverse of freedom or whether freedom is much wider than what slavery is. If you can see what I'm saying. Uh, slavery is being owned, slavery is being controlled, slavery is being exploited and abused. But what is freedom? Is freedom not being abused or is it a, an opportunity for self-development and uh, ambition, which is a little bit more than being ex the exact opposite, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay, can you explain a little more? Well, I was giving a course on uh, my book, and I started out by saying, okay, what's slavery to the people in the class? And some of them didn't like that. They said, well, of course we know what slavery is. And I said, yes, but do you know what freedom is? And you have to think about what it represented to the people who were escaping and what it was going to enable them to do if they were lucky enough to be able to uh, achieve what they wanted. Okay, do you know, I mean, do we know why some of these people escaped? Um, what was the well, impetus? Uh, some of them, as I said, some of the men escaped because their wives and children had been sold away and they didn't have anyone left. Some of them, the younger men, uh, often escaped because they heard that they were going to be sold. And in Maryland, one of the things about Maryland was the domestic slave trade. It was Maryland and Virginia were the sources of many uh, enslaved people who were sent down south to work in um, Mississippi, Alabama, 
and so forth, the states that were being developed later that had the cash crops like cotton. So you have to think about the fact that um, what was going on in terms of uh, Maryland and the fact that with the larger number of freed people and the fact that there was a domestic slave trade, even as people were being freed, more and more people who were being born into slavery were being sent south. So the number of people who were enslaved stayed almost steady while the number of people who were freed increased. Okay. Um, what about some of the people you didn't include? Was there, is there an example of an unproductive path to a story and, and how did you decide that? You mentioned a little bit before, but I'm wondering if you could say more about that. Well, I, I would hear about somebody, someone would say, you really need to look into so-and-so, or you really need to go to a such a, a certain source and I would look at it and I would get very excited and then I wouldn't be able to find anything else. So often there was a clue, the woman who did not get included in the book, I found out about because an archeologist had found her tombstone and uh, had then done a lot of research on her. But okay. Go ahead. There was nothing if in her own words. Uh, a lot of the people in the book either were interviewed or wrote something or had articles written about them that sometimes quoted them. Hmm. Would you say that there's a any typical pathway to freedom? No, I think people went any way they could. Anything they could think of that might work, they tried. Uh, probably everybody in the audience knows the story of Henry Box Brown, who got himself mailed in a box from Richmond, Virginia. There was somebody from Baltimore, Maryland, who did the same thing. They know this. I mentioned the story of the man who signed on to a whaling ship so that he would not be caught. There's a story I mentioned of the man who had enough money to get on a ship to England and stay in England while he was being uh, pursued in Connecticut. Oh, okay. Well, is there, are there any particular stories, one or two of them that you found especially compelling? And I think, why did you find them so? Well, somebody asked me in one of the talks I gave, who would I pick to, to star in a movie? And I said, everybody, all the stories are fascinating when you start looking at them carefully. Of course, some of them, you don't know all the details and that's very frustrating. But I think that when you think about each person and the decision they made and how they had to implement the path to freedom and, and who was helping them and was it the people that you hear about on the Underground Railroad or was it some people that are lesser known, often they were African-Americans enslaved and freed who were helping the people escaping and they remained anonymous. And they're not really talked about very much today. Uh, the, the spotlight is beginning to be shown on them. So there's not one or two stories that you would you would pick. Well, I did pick the story of the, the person on the whaling ship and the case of the couple who had the uh, revenge wreaked on them. Um, the, uh, there are two people I'm fond of because we know what happened to them up until their deaths. And you can see how they built a life as a uh, citizen, so to speak. They went from being an enslaved person to being a citizen, even though it wasn't a citizen with the same rights as someone who was white. And you could see what they achieved and how they were regarded in the their commuter community and in the wider community. Is there a third book coming? 
Not right now. Uh, people say, hey, what about Virginia? And I say, Virginia is very big and I don't know Virginia as well as Maryland and DC. Did it, so, okay. Was, did that, did your own background really help you as far as knowing where to go and your local background? Well, it wasn't my local background so much as my experience in the National Park Service with the National Underground Railroad oh. Network to Freedom and being the local uh, manager for the program for 17 years. I did 17 years of networking and getting to know people and helping them write the uh, documented accounts that were submitted and so forth. So there was a lot of uh, networking and teasing details out and then finding out, for example, uh, I would go to a, a plantation house museum and I'd say, do you have anybody on the Underground Railroad? And they'd say, no. And I'd say, well, do you have anybody who escaped from slavery? And they'd say, well, yes, we do. I'd say, well, <laughs> you have Underground Railroad. So you can't just look looking for the most obvious labels. You have to be a little bit more um, in, in genius in terms of... Uh, looking for the clues. Okay. Anything else you wanna add or share with us about what it took to, to write this book and? Well, I would just urge people to keep learning and to go out and do some research themselves to find some more people who are unknown heroes. Okay. All right, Donna, can we head back to you and see if there are any questions from the uh, audience? Well, we do actually have two questions. So I'll start with the first one from Lynn Roberts. Did Maryland have more than one abolitionist society? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, there's a difference between abolition, an abolitionist and someone who's anti-slavery. An abolitionist is usually defined as someone who's politically active. So the number of abolitionist societies does not necessarily equate with the number of people helping people to escape. You could have an example of someone who was a was passively anti-slavery. They would not have done anything against the law except when someone appeared on their doorstep and they realized that they were going to be caught and taken back to slavery and punished. And then they would do something, even if it was just overlooking the fact that they were sleeping in the barn or leaving some food out or something like that. So there were people who did not want to break the law, but did not believe in slavery. And that's not quite the same as being an abolitionist. Hi. Um, Stacy Hawkins asked, how long did it take you to write the book and to do all the re research? Did you realize when writing your first book that you had quite a bit of info to be able to start the second book? Yes. After I wrote the first book, I realized there was a lot more information on Maryland. And it turned out there was information I didn't have a clue to, to till I started doing the research. And some of the people I was going to work on, I decided were too well known. Uh, James Pembroke, for example, became um, James W.C. Uh, Pennington, who was a very well known black abolitionist and minister in New York. And uh, I thought, well, there's he's well enough known that I don't consider him an unknown hero. So. I decided not to include him, not to include some of the other people who were kind of at the level that um, some people know a lot about them, but not everybody, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, Alan Verda is asking, in your research, did you run across any information about Tom Matthews who escaped on the Underground Railroad in 1856? William still mentions him 
um, the newspaper ad offering a reward for his return says he came from the plantation of Ethan A. Jones near Bladensburg. The house still is, is standing and it's now known as Sportland in Berwyn Heights. No, I don't know anything about him, but you have to realize there were hundreds of people who were escaping. If you look at the number of runaway ads and what you have to do if you find someone a runaway ad is go back to the plantation and go back to the newspapers. And if there's nothing in the newspapers except a runaway ad, you've kind of come to a dead end until you think of something else. Another way to try and tease out the information. So I would consider what happened to the people who owned that, the family that owned that house. Do they have any papers? Do they know they have any papers? Uh, what happened to the, what was in the local newspapers at the time? Was there any account written of the escape? Okay. Um, if anybody else has any questions, please go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, at the moment, we don't have any other questions. Lee, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, not really. Okay. Jenny, is there anything else you wanted to say before we wrap up? Well, I think it's very important to think of these people as freedom seekers and not as fugitive slaves. Okay, um, Stacy just put in the chat, this was very interesting and thank you all. So if there's no further questions, I'm going to say thank you to Jenny and Lee for tonight's chat. And I appreciate everybody joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, and if you are not already a member, please consider becoming one or even making a donation, which you can do through our uh, website, www.pghistory.org. Um, our next chat is a uh, going to be a week later um, than normal. It's going to be on the fifth Monday, uh, Monday, July 31st at 7 p.m. And we will chat about whether dinosaurs are historic. And finally, all of our history chats are posted on our YouTube channel, which you can also access through our website, www.pghistory.org. So um, this will be up shortly, and um, you can go back and also see ones you may have missed in the series. So um, again, thank you, everybody, and um, I'm going to end the recording.